That's uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. Since I've already read the text, I'm not going to read it again, but I will be making references to it as we move through. And essentially what we're wanting uh, to look at this morning is the introduction to the book, which is in verses 1 through 4. And then look at this first, um, the, the first account that we have here, which is of the angel appearing to Zacharias uh, in, in the temple and uh, revealing to him the fulfillment of the promise that we looked at in Malachi chapter 4. So may the Lord, again, bless his word to our hearing. So as we, uh, as we begin the, the Gospel of Luke, uh, just wanted to explain again uh, why we would look at a gospel, okay? Now, we know that every part of God's word is, is important. Each, each piece of it, each part of it, each book has its part in, in the overall thrust of, of the book, uh, uh, this collection of books, which is to reveal to us... Uh, you know, the situation that we fell into at the beginning in, in Adam, it explains to us why we are in the situation that we are. It explains to us uh, what it is that um, basically God planned to do about it, which is to send the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent, and of course, in so doing, uh, to give his life in order that we may live. The Old Testament even narrows down exactly who that seed would be through promises and prophecies. And as a matter of fact, there is a part in the Old Testament that tells us exactly when the Messiah was to come. Uh, that's that prophecy concerning the 70 weeks of Daniel. If you get the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem correct, well, we find that Jesus appears at, at that exact time. The Messiah comes and begins uh, his, his ministry. Quite interesting. Now, the Old Testament, we know, is, is also very important, not only because it, it gives us foundational principles, again, showing us our predicament, the predicament we're in because of Adam, because of our own sins and what God intends to do about it. But it's also important because uh, it contains the moral law, which is something that is still applicable today. Uh, it's not only, you know, it's, it not only contains that law, but also shows us many different ways in how we apply it, how we actually live. I mean, think of the book of Proverbs. It's an application of the law of God. And why is it important? Well, because again, our Lord Jesus lived according to that law. He obeyed it in order to fulfill righteousness, and he obeyed it so we could obey it. So we want to learn how to please God. But the New Testament, I think we would all say, is arguably more important than the Old Testament because it shows us the fulfillment of all of these things, and especially in these four Gospels. If I were to ask you, you know, if you had a choice of, of only one book out of the entire Bible, what, which book would you choose? Now, we might choose, you know, a variety of different books for different reasons, but really, which, which book should we choose? I would say one of the four Gospels would be one of the ones that I would want to choose because, again, it reveals to us our Lord Jesus. Now, it's interesting that the Lord has given us four Gospels. And we need to understand why it is he's given us for. The reason is because when it comes to, to establishing any truth, the truth of anything, the Lord tells us in his word that we need at least two witnesses to do so. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, the last part of it, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Nothing would be confirmed by the witness of one, even though I think that's the way we do it in our law system today. Uh, the danger that anyone could make any accusation is there. You need at least two, and three, of course, is better. But the Lord has given to us four, and when you think about it, he's given to us even more than four, because as we read in the introduction to the Gospel of Luke, that Luke went out and he basically interviewed several eyewitnesses when he was researching his Gospel. And he's not talking just about the other gospel writers here, he is talking about those outside of the gospel writers as well as them. So that's why this is important. These are testimonies to the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament to send Jesus into the world in order to live and to die so that we might have life. And it also, of course, helps us to understand better how to apply what God has given us in the Old Testament so that we might live a life that is pleasing to him. And we're going to get a lot of that through this gospel. 
So let's begin by looking at some introductory matters. First of all, why we believe that the author is Luke. You know, it's interesting that he doesn't identify himself as the author. When, when the gospel writers are writing, they don't necessarily identify themselves. As a matter of fact, John you know, almost eliminates his even showing up in the book, even though he's a participant. And Matthew or, or Mark, uh, Mark actually, I don't think was, oh no, he was there. He shows up in the book. He's believed to be the one who was wearing the sheets and had to leave it behind when he went running away when Jesus was taken uh, by the, the soldiers. But Luke is not a participant in this book, and he doesn't identify himself as an author. It's not like Paul writing a letter to one of the churches where he says, Paul, an apostle, and he gives his credentials. Uh, Luke is, is this anonymous author. His name doesn't appear in the book because he's not a part of this history. He wasn't converted until all these things actually took place. But we do know that the person who wrote the book of Luke is also the person who wrote the book of Acts. This book, he tells us in Acts, is a, an account of what Jesus began to do and to teach. And then he tells us in Acts what Jesus continued to do and teach through his apostles. Now, in the book of Acts, we see the author of that book often traveling with Paul, not all the time. Sometimes he is and sometimes he isn't. And when we compare the movements of this one who is writing the book with those whom, whom we knew were Paul's uh, companions, and we look at, at the style of his writing, we look at the detail of his writing, we look at the reading level of his writing. Uh, you know, in, in seminary and uh, college, we had to study Greek, and the Greek of John is quite a bit different than the Greek you find in Luke. Luke's is very difficult to translate. John's is extremely easy. It just shows his education. This was an educated man. He's using pretty uh, complex words and, and word structures. It shows that he is, again, an educated man. And so the most obvious choice among all of these would be Luke. And also we should note that the uh, testimony of the church historically, unanimously, was that Luke was the author of this particular gospel. Now, second, we know that the audience is Theophilus, okay? The same is true of the book of Acts. They were both written to Theophilus. Now, we don't know very much about Theophilus aside from what Luke tells us here. This is really the only thing we know about him. His name means lover of God, somebody who loves God. This could be his real name or it could be a pseudonym, you know, that's meant to hide his true identity. But certainly, it is a name that should describe everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how do we know whether we, we know him? It's whether we love him, right? So this is a believer, okay? This is somebody, whether it's his true name or not, this person knows the Lord. Now, the phrase that Luke uses to describe him, most excellent Theophilus, the, that title is actually used exclusively for Roman officials. We believe that this man was likely a Gentile, a Gentile believer, right? And somebody who was in the Roman government, which could be the reason why the pseudonym is actually used here instead of perhaps his real name. It could have been his real name, but it could be a name again to hide his identity. Now, the fact that Luke dedicated the book to him could mean that Theophilus was his patron, you know, being in Roman government, he, ha he was a man of means, and perhaps uh, Luke was looking to him and dedicating the book to him in order to fund the book's publication. You know, we don't think about books being published in those days, but they actually were. There was no printing press. That wasn't invented, I think, until the 1500s. And handwritten copying was pretty expensive. You know, it was more than Luke would have been able to afford. So if it is true that he dedicated the book to Theophilus, it's also true, that, and, and that Theophilus was his patron to have it published, it's also true that Luke intended a wider uh, readership than just Theophilus himself. But I think the most important thing to note here about this introduction is the reason why Luke wrote his gospel. He says to Theophilus in verse 4, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Now, he tells us here that Theophilus had been taught. Theophilus had been discipled. Maybe Luke was the one who discipled him. Maybe others discipled him. But the Spirit moved Luke, where others, he said, had started to, you know, many had undertaken this work, but none really finished. Uh, 
Luke, by the Spirit, under the Apostle Paul's supervision, we believe, uh, was moved to provide an even more precise account of the person and work and teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ so that Theophilus might know the exact truth of these things. You know, today we often content ourselves with just sort of having a general idea of what it is God says and what it is He wants us to do. Luke here is going through the, the pain of all this research and writing so that this disciple could know the exact truth of what God says. It shows us the importance of knowing truth. God revealed these things to us so that we might know it. He has given to us His whole word, inspired and inerrant, uh, to us so that we may know it. He preserved it so that we may know it. He tells us to study it so that we may know it because it's important that we know the exact truth of what it is the Lord has said. And again, not just generalities because when it comes down to it, God has told us specifically what He wants us to believe, specifically what He wants us to do. That is His revealed will. And so if we love Him, that's what we're going to want to know. That's what we're going to want to do. So with, with that in mind, let's see what it is that, that God wants us to know from the Gospel of Luke. Um, and that we're going to discover as we go through the book. But first of all, as I mentioned before, He wants us to see as we begin the fulfillment of his promises. I've already pointed out the Old Testament closes with these words, the Lord spoke to the prophet Malachi in Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. Behold, I am going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now, once the Lord said that, he didn't speak again until that silence was broken here. 400 years later, when he sent his messenger Gabriel to announce the birth of the, this forerunner of his son. Again, the Old Testament closes with the prediction. The New Testament opens with the fulfillment of that prediction or that prophecy. So let's take a look at what's taking place now in verses 5 through 25. First, uh, Luke tells us, and again, he's, he's an historian, right? He's giving to us a complete history. He makes note of various details. He even locates uh, peoples and, and places and so forth in a way that some of the other gospel writers don't. The first thing we see here is when this took place. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, he says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea. Back then... They didn't use the calendar with regard to years. They only used it with regard to months and days. There, there were not years except years dated from the rule of some public figure. And so that's how Luke is identifying or locating the time here. These were the days of Herod. Herod the Great, the one who rebuilt the temple and the one who would later send his soldiers to try and kill the Messiah. Secondly, we see the one through whom the prophecy would be fulfilled. We're introduced to Zacharias. Now, Zacharias, we're told, was a priest. He was a descendant of Aaron, you know, Moses' brother. Remember, the priests all had to come from Aaron's line. He tells us that, again, a lot of detail here, he was of the division of Abijah. Now, there was only one temple, you know, one temple that the Jews worshipped in. And the priests would all serve in the temple uh, on a rotating basis. The division of Abijah was the eighth of 24 divisions. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was, um, I think, um, well, let's just put it this way. Each division ministered for a week in the temple, and they did that twice a year. So you essentially had this rotation going on of these 24 divisions working their way uh, through the temple. Now, his wife Elizabeth, we're told, was also a descendant, from, or was also descended from Aaron. Uh, so, essentially, here is um, uh, a priest who is married to someone who is also in the priestly family. Now, the question we might ask is, why did the Lord choose them for what it is we're about to see happen? Well, there is an interesting description of them here in verse six. 
we see that they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Why did he use them? Well, it's because they were chosen vessels. They were those who were cleansing themselves. As Paul had talked to Timothy, if a man cleanses himself from uh, these corruptions and these imperfections, then he will be a vessel useful to the Lord. By God's grace, they were doing what he had called them to do and what the Lord really calls all of us to do. They were living for God's glory. Now, we shouldn't think necessarily that Zacharias and Elizabeth, by their own good works, stood out in God's eyes and then God chose them. This is something that God had chosen from all eternity. But what it does mean is that God gave them the grace because he had chosen them for this purpose. And he gave them the grace to do this. And they were working with that grace and seeking to become what the Lord had made them to be. That was a part of his plan so that he might use these holy vessels to carry out his purpose. And again... If, you don't, if we don't get the point here, that's what the Lord wants us to do, right? Cleanse ourselves from the things that are sinful so that we might be useful to Him. Now, third, we see that Zacharias and Elizabeth had a problem. They were childless. And being old, there seemed to be no natural hope of them yet having children. I want you to see the desire here for children, right? In our culture, you know, our culture of basically self-indulgence, we often see children as something that gets in the way rather than something that is a blessing, right? But in the Jewish culture, and certainly it should be the case with us, they looked at children as a blessing. Think about what the psalmist writes in Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Solomon writes this, Behold, children are a gift to the Lord. And if anybody knew about that, it would be him, right? Because he had a number of wives and undoubtedly, a number of children, and yet with all these children, he didn't see them as getting in his way. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb uh, is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. They wanted children, Right? Now, Zacharias and Elizabeth had been praying for years that the Lord would grant them children. They had been praying into their old age, but so far he hadn't, he hadn't answered them. Now, here's another interesting point. How many times does the Lord do this in, in Scripture? How many times does he make his people wait for the answers to their prayers? How many times does he make us wait before he answers our prayers? I mean, think about Abraham. God made him a promise that he would make his descendants as numerous as the stars of the heavens, and I think that was when Abraham might have been 75, and he had to wait till he was about 100 before that promise was fulfilled. I mean, how long did Joseph suffer in prison? He had those visions about how, you know, the sun, moon, and the stars all bowed down to him and so forth. He knew something was going to happen, but things seemed to be going the opposite direction. He was taken by his, his, uh, his brothers and almost killed, sold as a slave into Egypt. He eventually, because of Potiphar's wife, went into prison. And he was there for years. But how long was it before the promise of God was fulfilled for him? And how long was it before, you know, from the time Jesus was promised at the fall of Adam and Eve to the time he came? You know, the Lord hears our prayers as soon as we pray. The Bible says that when we pray according to his will, that he's actually already answered those prayers. You know, I, perhaps in the sense that Paul says we're already in heaven. It's a done deal. We're going to get what it is we've asked for. But we don't often see the answer to his prayers for quite some time. And the reason isn't because God isn't intending on giving it to us, but it's because we're not yet ready to receive what it is that he wants to give to us. We need to remember that the Lord has his timing. And the reason why he's, he's delaying is because he wants to work some grace in us. And I think that's what he's doing here as well. Now, fourthly, we see the Lord's answer to their prayers, finally, while Zacharias was ministering to the Lord. Now, when he entered into the temple to burn incense, and one commentator points out, because of the number of priests that were involved in each division, uh, the num because of the number of priests, it's quite likely that this might be the only time in Zacharias' life that he went into the temple to burn incense. Okay, this was not something he would do on a regular basis. Uh, 
we read the people were outside praying. And what were they praying about? Well, when the incense is being offered with the sacrifice, uh, they were praying that the Lord might receive it on their behalf and have mercy on them. Well, it was while Zacharias was engaged in this that Gabriel appears to him. And at first, Zacharias was afraid. It's not every day you see an angel, and particularly in the temple. What was the angel here to do? Was the angel here to strike me down? Is there some sin in my life? Remember, if they weren't, you know, if they hadn't dealt with their own sins first, which they were supposed to do, they hadn't repented of everything before they appeared in the Lord's presence, the Lord might very well strike them down. So why is this angel here? But Gabriel immediately comforts him to allay that concern. He tells him the Lord has heard his prayer. Elizabeth will bear a son. And they were to give him the name John. Now, the name John means gracious. It's used to refer to something graciously given by the Lord, a gracious gift, which is really, uh, which is really an apt description for everything that the Lord gives to us because we don't deserve any of these things. It's purely a gift of His grace, and especially when it comes to children. But now, fifthly, the angel points out that this gift that, that he had, is coming to announce to them was not something that was just for them, okay? Just as the things that the Lord gives to us are not always purely for ourselves, but that we might use them to help others. So it was with this child. He says in verse 14, many will rejoice at his birth. A lot of people are going to be happy about this, not just you, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And the question is, why? Why would they rejoice? Well, he gives several reasons. First of all, in verse 15, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 11, 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now, he does go on to say, but he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. He's not saying, John is the greatest born among women but any of you who believe, you're, you're greater than he is. That, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. And the only one who really qualifies, because John was also least in the kingdom. He was a humble servant. The only one who beat him was the Lord Jesus. I think he was referring to himself. So this one will be great in the sight of the Lord. Verse 15, he goes on to say, he will drink no wine or liquor. Now, we do know that in the Bible that, that is permissible. We're not to be drunk with wine. We're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But he would completely abstain from it. And the reason was he would be a Nazarite from birth, which means someone who is completely devoted to the Lord. When someone took the vow of a Nazarite, he withdrew from certain things for a period of time and devoted himself entirely to the Lord. John the Baptist would be like that throughout his entire life. By the way, it's what the Lord calls us to do right? We are called not to be Nazarites necessarily, but we are called to devote ourselves, everything we do, whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, to the glory of God. He goes on to say he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. In other words, he would be regenerated. He would be a new creature in the womb. He would be sanctified and empowered even before he was born. Now, that is not the norm. That is the exception. And how do we know that's the case? Well, look at yourself when you were a child. Look, look, look at our children. They don't come out of the womb empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit. They essentially come out as sinners who need to be saved. Now, we know that this, um, this explains why when we'll see later, uh, Mary comes in to see Elizabeth after she hears about Elizabeth and she knows that she's going to bear the Messiah. First thing that happens is John the Baptist leaps in her womb. So he's responding to the fact that Messiah is present because of this presence of the Holy Spirit in his life, because of the new nature in him. He's, uh, Gabriel goes on to say regarding John in verse 16, he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And then he goes on in verse 17 to say this, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him. Now notice the, who the him is here. To the Lord their God. He's the antecedent. Okay? It is he who, who will go as a foreigner before him, the Lord their God, who is coming in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, 
so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And we'll see this happening later. But essentially, he's going to preach the law and repentance with the power and the effectiveness of Elijah. If you look in the Old Testament, you see Elijah was quite, quite the prophet. There were times when he was bold as a lion and other times when perhaps he withdrew. But man, when he was ministering, he was empowered. But the purpose was to get the people ready for the coming of their Lord. But then sixthly, we see Zacharias had a hard time believing this. He had a hard time accepting that this could really happen. I mean, he had been praying in faith. You know, he wasn't just thinking he was wasting his breath as he was praying. But, you know, that God would give him a child. But now that God is finally answering that prayer, he's saying, well, how can it happen? His faith was faltering. But here again, I, I think we need to see God's grace. It may look like judgment, but it's, but it's not. It's God's grace. First of all, he didn't withdraw the blessing. Zacharias, you don't believe? Okay, I'm going to move on to someone else. Maybe they'll believe. No. He doesn't withdraw the blessing. God's plan is still going to move forward. But Zacharias, you need to learn a lesson here. I'm going to take away your ability to speak until this comes to pass and it will come to pass. This is discipline. Remember, Zacharias was righteous in the eyes of the Lord, not because he was self-righteous, but because he was saved and he was walking with the Lord. So we read in verses 19 and 20, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and, and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. They will be fulfilled. You know, he's not withdrawing the blessing, but you won't be able to speak. So we see that when he came outside to speak to those who by this time were concerned, why is Zacharias tearing in the temple? Why is it taking him so long? Was he struck dead for his sins? Will God not receive us? Well, he did come out, and to their relief, but when he came out, he found that he could not speak, as the angel said. And by the way, the discipline that the Lord enacts on him here was gracious and it was meant for his good. And when John is born, we see Zacharias learned his lesson. He rejoiced too. When it came time to name him, he says, no, his name, he, he was making signs, you know, at first, but then he says, no, his name is John. You see, he began, he began to uh, be able to speak after he confirms that this is the answer to the angel's uh, prophecy. So finally, when his service had ended, he, ret he returns home, and as the angel said, Elizabeth conceives, and they were both filled with joy. Even though he couldn't speak, doesn't mean he couldn't enjoy what it was the Lord was giving to them. God had answered their prayers. God had given them a son. But even more, he had given them the forerunner of the Messiah. That's far more important because that means somebody is close at hand, the one they had been waiting for for centuries. Now again, we may need to wait a while to see the Lord's answers to our prayers, but we need to remember the Lord will do what He has promised. We see a great example of it here. How many years did it take between the promise and the fulfillment? 400 years, right? How long did it take before the coming of Jesus Christ? Well, let's see. <laughs> it's uh, quite a number of years from the fall of mankind and their redemption all the way to the coming of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, which um, is around 4,000 years. So the Lord sometimes tarries, but he will fulfill his promises. And actually, because he has given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will also give us with him everything else that he has promised. Because we read in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. If the Lord would not withhold his son from us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He's going to give us the greater. He's going to give us the lesser. God is faithful, and that's what we want to see from this text. Faithful to save and faithful to, again, fulfill all of his promises to us.
Well, that's what the table reminds us of also this morning is God's faithfulness in sending his son. He was willing to give us again his son. How will he not also give us all things? That's what we need to be reminded of as we come to the table. So as we bow in just a moment of prayer, let's ask the Lord to to help us as we think about his faithfulness, as we think about the things we've prayed for and we haven't seen the answer to, to remember God is going to answer those prayers. He is going to give us what he has promised he will give us in his time for our good. And if he decides to withhold certain things from us, we do need to remember even those things are for our good as well, aren't they? Okay. But again, if if he's given us his son, we know he's going to give us all that he has promised to give us as it will work together for our good. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's um, pray and prepare ourselves to come to the table.